Hola. Hello. Hola. Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Hello. Good evening for some of you. Good morning for others. One of the best things we got out of this pandemic is the fact that we can actually wish uh, us uh, the best <laughs> at the same time every day, like saying good morning and good evening every, every day at the same time. Good morning to the second session of Greg Pro. Yesterday, if you remember, we spoke about optimism. Today, we will be discussing collaborations and mappings. We will start with Barcelona and the local theaters initiative, 10 venues in Barcelona. Actually, seven of them are represented here today. Uh, we'll explain what they do and how they cook their menu because it's a two course menu today. The first one being local theaters and the second one devoted to Ibero-American mappings. So good morning and good evening. Welcome anyhow to you all. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for joining us. This is Greg, well, we, we, we did together, but especially thanks to somebody who had it uh, fixed in his mind that this had to happen and that's Sesc. So thank you, Sesc. Thank you very much, uh, all of you for joining us. Mariona, the floor is yours. Hello, good evening, good morning. As uh, Martha just said, I would like to start by thanking Greg for having invited us and having suggested to organize this session. We will present a project that uh, we are really enthusiastic about. As Martha was saying, 10 small format uh, local proximity theaters, as we like to define ourselves, uh, are the creators of this uh, project. We are all venues from Barcelona. This is our website that you are seeing now. And this is an online space, uh, a platform that we have designed in order to get in touch with the audience. We had been working for some months already, collaborating uh, with other venues in Catalonia under the framework of the Theatre uh, Companies Associations of Catalonia. And little by little, different cooperation projects were born, different gatherings were born as well. So in this case, thanks to Greg, we have been able to We'll devise this online project. It's not um, a substitute. The idea is not for this to replace anything, but at least we can cover some programmings and some ideas that we wanted to to hold uh, in this uh, in this edition of the Greg Festival in July. Of course, due to the pandemic, due to the COVID-19, many premieres had uh, to be cancelled. Many companies couldn't uh, attend. They couldn't possibly travel from Latin America. So somehow we decided to move online, to go online, move on to the internet and uh, well, still still do it, still hold it. So this is the central space as we call it. It's the virtual online space and different uh, workshops are being organized, round tables, readings, screenings, conferences, as you see, we're sharing the screen now. There are different activities, over 30 different activities uh, generated, produced, by these 10 venues, local venues uh, from Barcelona. That was a very uh, quick and uh, brief overview about our platform. That's where theater still beats, uh, as we like to, to say. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce the representatives of the different uh, seven venues that are joining us today so that they can, well, give us a glimpse about their projects and their link with Latin America in this case. There are three venues, three theaters, the, the Artium, uh, venue, the Antique Theatre and La Gleva. These three venues are not uh, joining us today here in this uh, live uh, Zoom session, but they, they are part of the project and their information is indeed included in the, on, on the website. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce Isabel Bress from Teatra Academia. Hello, hello everyone. Good evening, good morning, as it applies. Teatra Academia this year should have had organized uh, an, uh, a show by Laura Marcel, uh, 
uh, with Norbert Martinez, uh, production by the Greek festival itself, and La Jarra Azul, and Us Espectacular with uh, Oscar Garcia, the the director who was actually who was actually here, a uh, Winnipeg. A uh, video art was uh, oh, it actually opened yesterday, and it's in on the YouTube channel, uh, on our YouTube channel, the Teatra Academia. And at 18 hours today, you will be able, if you want to join a live Instagram uh, broadcast about the Winnipeg uh, comic, uh, because that's the origin of this project. It's an adaptation of the illustrated book slash comic Winnipeg, entitled Winnipeg by Antonia Santolaya and uh, collaborators. I, I think it's worthwhile mentioning this. Of course, this was born in Barcelona, Winnipeg, the show, um, the play was uh, born in Barcelona and it uh, discusses the exile of many Spaniards and not only Spaniards on board of this Winnipeg uh, boat. And of course, um, it well, it's about the exile of thousands of Spaniards, not just as a consequence of the Spanish Civil War, but also throughout all history. So speaking of exile today is really, well, very, it's very fashionable. And unfortunately, it's um, a current and a hot topic, many with different scenarios involved, but still exile is um, a thing. So Winnipeg was created in order to celebrate the 80th anniversary of this, uh, of this uh, fact, and the Winnipeg, and the idea is to go on tour internationally. So that was the beginning. It's been, and the whole, the whole project, everything has been adapted uh, because uh, the idea is to create a bridge. Uh, it's important to maintain this bridge and uh, keep it alive. Uh, this bridge, I mean, between Spain and Latin America. It's a beautiful play very relevant, very current. It's important to take a look on exile from a contemporary perspective. So language has also been adapted and we have live cameras and we have singing. So and it's been handicrafted. It's beautiful, really, really very, very delicate as, a, as, as an object, I should say. So again, it's, I mean, I, I cannot recommend it enough as you can hear from my voice tone. Teatra Academia, well, we uh, always uh, believe in going international, so every year we try to go on tour with one of our show, one of our plays. So far, we haven't been able to go to Latin America. It's not, uh, well, we've not had the opportunity. Hopefully, hopefully that will be the case soon enough. We are eager to go to Latin America. Am I doing fine with time, Marina? Is that okay as a first uh, introduction? Yes, indeed. You did just great, Isabel. After Isabel from Teatra Academia, I would like to speak myself. I represent the Malda Theatre. It's a, a small, very small theatre, very small venue in the city of Barcelona. It's not a, a theatre room in itself. It's a, a little room in a Gothic palace and we've been uh, doing uh, performing arts since uh, a, lot, a long time ago. Since 2013 we have uh, a company inside, a theatre company, and we have three objectives. We would like to support stable companies. We ourselves are a theatre company and we want the theater fabric to grow stronger and stronger. The performing arts need to be all need to be represented, not just text based uh, theater, but also movement um, from all different uh, uh, sides, music uh, needs to be represented and we want to work together with different companies. So we reach out to the audience and we seek their complicity. That's what we want, physical, 
proximity and conceptual uh, proximity, if you allow me to put it this way, uh, con conceptual proximity vis-a-vis -vis our uh, audience. So it's not just about performing arts, but we work on theater production, so we produce the uh, plays of our resident uh, companies and other uh, projects uh, from other companies that maybe lack a structure, an infrastructure or a room. So we act in that case as producers. And well, we were supposed to premiere under the umbrella of the Greg Festival. It's called Una Galaxia de Luciérnagas. It's uh, by um, Menorcan author Aina Tour. She is based in Barcelona. Aina came to us with a text and uh, the main value I think um, uh, with uh, Ines with Ines text is the fact that it really calls upon the the, the viewer because she speaks of a first person experience she had 20 years ago in a Latin American country. She was the victim of, a, of an assault, of a physical attack, and it had some consequences. So, of course, this uh, put us in front of the mirror, uh, the privilege of those of us who were born in a city like Barcelona or a country like Spain and what this uh, entails and what this means and what privileges this this brings uh, to us it's a super interesting uh, project it's a monologue and we've um, uh, premiered somehow in inverted commas uh, a first reading of the project it will of course it will be uh, on the next year with the opening of the next season whenever possible and i think it only makes sense that we that we do it just now and hopefully greg will help us uh, uh, well provide it with the continuity that it deserves let me not uh, hold the mic any longer i would like to introduce now felipe cabezas from sala phoenix Hello, good evening. My name is Felipe Cabezas. I am the director at Sala Phoenix. I'm going to speak about a project that's called Cabaret de Ida y Vuelta. You can find it in on the Greg uh, on the Greg site and on our website. It's uh, well, we've prepared a reduced version for you know because of the of the circumstances. It's radio theater. It's a radio theater play that we will be opening. Uh, next week. It, this is a play, it's um, comical, it's it's musical, so it's a literary cabaret, and we tell different stories. All these stories have something in common. There are stories about uh, people, also historical characters uh, that traveled from Latin America to Spain or the other way around, so they received influences from the other uh, culture, so it's about coming and going. That's the idea of this uh, log, like a sailor's log. And it's, um, it helps us uh, explain, for instance, the uh, story of Miguel de Molina Mala, uh, uh, a singer who was uh, homosexual. He was born in Malaga and he was, uh, of course, repressed and discriminated. The second story that we share is uh, about uh, Latin American writers that uh, fled from the dictatorships in Latin America and, well, uh, looked out for refuge in Spain. So it's about the difficulty when it comes to, well, migrating, the difficulties that uh, those writers had to face uh, when reaching Spain. Um, and the third story is about Moctezuma's, um, Moctezuma's granddaughter. And that was uh, 1530. We, we use this story to talk about machoism in the colonies and the sacking in Latin America. And this is all narrated under the context of a, of a, of a tavern, uh, kind of a pub. And you see that the cast includes many different characters. We have live music, uh, one pianist, two singers, two actors, and uh, the narrator in my case. We want to uh, well, go with this uh, play live next year that will be the premiere the official premiere but to 
but it's not just that. We want to explore another format. We are uh, doing research in this in this sense because we want to dive into radio theater. Uh, we will open next Monday, as I said before. It's a magical, wonderful format that will help us, uh, well, work without any borders. And then also uh, streaming-based uh, theater. That's what we've been doing so far at Sala Phoenix. It's been interesting, interesting. Uh, it's been profitable as well. It's been it's been fun. So we want this to continue. And then we have a small version. Uh, my personal experience as an actor myself, I've, I've traveled around the world, Korea, Germany, Portugal, and uh, I've done this only with one suitcase as as all baggage. So I want to to continue doing doing this so traveling around the world with a little play that can resonate with everyone so don't forget stay tuned because we will be online digitally on monday and you will be learning more about miguel de molina and his uh, story if you join us on Monday. Great. Let's uh, move on now to Sala Flyhard. We have Sergio. Yes. Okay, Sergio, there you are. Yes, very briefly. The, we would like to thank Greg for this opportunity. We are co producing with the Latin American venue. We only have 45 seats. Uh, so when Greg offered this opportunity, we we saw that we wanted to collaborate with Buenos Aires because uh, it's a similar philosophy. They started off uh, and very small. We started also very small in the Sands district in Barcelona. And I think we shared the way in which we explain and tell our stories. Actually, last week we also did some session similar to this one uh, via Zoom. and. Um, we had the, the director of our venue, Sala Flyhard, and uh, I will write down the link for you on the chat so that you can take a look at uh, this video. So we saw immediately that we would work well with uh, bueno, Buenos Aires and uh, we are just eager. We are eager for the project to, to begin. The first thing we valued or considered was how to co-produce this because the idea in this case was to work with Greg and with Tim De Cuatro, we uh, well ro reached the conclusion that maybe it would be a good idea to work with four Catalan actors and actresses, but the direction would be carried out by someone from Buenos Aires. So Perotti is an author, director, founding member of Team Timbre Cuatro. And uh, well, ever since we met, we had an instant connection. And then as the first play right goes, we we have a connection with uh, Miro and uh, well, we couldn't work with him in the past for many different reasons. So now he's uh, joined us. Jose, Jose Maria, Jose is uh, author of El Principio de Arquímedes, among other plays, and he has a long standing experience, not just in, in Catalonia, but also in Argentina. So he, for us, was the perfect uh, author. And that was supposed to also be part of the Greg Festival, but unfortunately, it will have to wait until next year. But it started, all the uh, artistic uh, team it's already closed. Jose has a first version of the text. It's, uh, and I don't want to, well, hold the mic any any longer, but tomorrow at the Teatras de Proximitat, our Zoom channel at eight o'clock tomorrow, the director and the author will be presenting this text, which is called The White Room, Habitación Blanca. And, um, you will learn more about how this uh, project will be approached. So again, let me use the chat and there you will find the link if you want to subscribe, if you're interested, if you want to know more about this White Room project, we will be there tomorrow. Excellent. So 
we're going to go to actions now from the book hello yes i would also like to thank greg for inviting us to be here with you and i'd like to tell you who we are Bada Badoc is led by me and Guala Cejas from Argentina, and then you'll understand the strong bones we have and why we program and we do what we do. We are one of the youngest venues. We're only five years old. We've turned five this year, and we're quite small. 40 57, 55 seats, depending on the arrangement. And um, we're a bridge between Barcelona and Latin America, particularly Buenos Aires. And over the last four years, apart from our first year, we've programmed and uh, shown and co-produced several plays and uh, we've had people from Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Costa Rica. So, yeah, we have all these connections, but it's true that our main bone is Buenos Aires and also Peru. That was the piece we were going to bring this year to Greg. The piece is called The Surname Starts With Me by Chasca Mori. I believe she's around. El apellido empieza conmigo. The surname starts with me. We want to thank her and all of them from the team for all their hard work before this tragic pandemic turned up and destroyed our plans. The play will be reprogrammed for May 2021. And before then, we have prepared some actions that you can see on our channel, Teatres de Proximitat. So we have, first of all, the surname starts with me, which in the beginning, it was going to be a documentary. But then because of uh, something that happened while they were working on the documentary, it became a play. And now, when we were thinking of uh, what we could do to replace the original proposal, we decided to go to plan A, to use all that unused material that was never used for uh, the play, because there is a strong visual element there. And there is a revision, which is called The Surname Starts With Me, Variation 2. You can see it on our YouTube channel, Bada Badok, on Thursday, 16th at 7 p.m. Spain time. So that will be the debut. And then at 8 o'clock on Zoom of Teatres de Proximitat, we'll have a discussion session and presentation of the project with the whole team, Chasca Mori and lots more. And that's that. If you want uh, any more information please ask thank you we're going now to tantarantana with ferran i believe oh we did have ferran at any rate yes sorry i was trying to unmute myself good morning or good afternoon whatever good evening it's a pleasure to be here with you and talk about our project at the festival. First of all, let me tell you about Tantarantana, because our project for the festival comes from the creation of Tantarantana. Tantarantana has a lot of creation, but also uh, theater shows. We've been working for eight years. Since 2017, we've been accepted as a creative factory. That's our label. Something that characterizes us is how we uh, creatively support companies and we support social, community and international projects. So our proposal for the festival this year is uh, very special for us. It's uh, uh, the result of two years. This project started out in 2018. Uh, 
it is a scenic uh, a stage project, the result of five Catalan authors and five Colombian authors. And it is the result of a cooperation between Tan Tarantana from Barcelona and Maldita Vanidad from Bogota. This is the result of the fusion of two projects that we started out. One of them was, uh, well, just <laughs> our desire to, to, to just take the leap and, and start cooperating on playwriting. That started out in 2014. We had an exchange of proposals from different Ever-American countries. And uh, then we selected them here and presented them. And we also had readings of Catalan authors over the other side of the pond. A love story was uh, created there was born there with La Maldita Vanidad, and that's when we realized that we could go further and we could create a, <laughs> a double a show. I mean, double show because there are two bodies, but it's four hands or ten hands because there are ten Catalan playwrights and uh, so five Catalan playwrights, five Colombian ones. It started out in 2018. And... Uh, we wanted to link it to the Greg Festival and particularly to the theme this year, which was spirituality and violence. And that's how we started writing. The 10 authors were coordinated by a kind of a supporting playwright who acted as a kind of consultant for the uh, Catalan-Colombian couples that were created. The project uh, came uh, was the result of uh, an artistic residency in Bogota. Everybody went to Bogota, all the playwrights and the couples met there and started writing. And they created in two processes, two texts. The final show was presented the Colombian part in the district of Palermo in December 2019 with an itinerant show, the first version of The Night Without Time or Timeless Night. We showed it in different streets of the Barrio de Palermo, which is where La Maldita Vanidad is. And the next step was to come to Barcelona within the festival with the same proposal. And because of the problems uh, we had, obviously, all the adaptation of the texts which were based on Palermo had to do on Skype. It was hard because we, we had to adapt it to the Barcelona district of Raval. And we're happy with the result. I mean, it has been extremely difficult with the whole COVID situation, but this has meant that we have had to rebuild the project. From the 15th of July, we'll be able to see the night without time or timeless night, which is a sound theater show, which takes the spectator through different streets and squares of El Raval in Barcelona with different scenes of the main character, Spolete. And uh, it helps us discover that district, the streets, and how it has evolved, it has been transformed. We saw some similarities between Palermo and Raval because both districts have evolved. They've been transformed with the people who've been inhabiting it. We invite you all to join us on this remote walk. And I'd like to finish mentioning the parallel sessions like the, today, this evening at 8 Spanish time, we'll have a discussion session with all the artistic team both the Colombian side and the Catalan side. And then on the 20th, we'll have a workshop, a contamination <laughs> workshop. It's a workshop where 10 people from uh, different countries, 10 from Latin America, 10 from women from Catalonia, are going to do something similar to what we did with a Timeless Night. If you have any questions, queries, uh, please get in touch. Thank you. Great.
So we're now going to the last venue, Versus. Before I give the floor to Jofra, I'd like to ask you to, if you have any questions, queries for the speakers, please write your question on the chat and we will put it to the relevant person. Okay. We'll do our best at any rate. So, Jofra, can you tell us about Versus Glorious? Yes. Hello, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce ourselves as a theater. We've been alive uh, for 15 years as a company, and since 2018, we started managing this theater or venue. It is one of the oldest theaters, private theaters in Barcelona. It used to be the old Versos Theater, and since 2018, we changed management and name. It is now Sala versus Gloria. And uh, well, 2019 was very, very busy socially and economically, and 2020 has been the year of the pandemic. We're so looking forward to 2021. It's going to be great. Now, for the festival, uh, we want to thank Greg and Sesk particularly. It is our first year at Greg, and it was uh, Sesk who gave us the opportunity to work with My Green, the company whose show was bringing, we're bringing here to Barcelona. It's a Cuban company. A part of the company lives in Madrid some of them in Miami, there is one of them in Cuba. And after talking to them over the last few days, just to, you know, be in touch and see how we were going to develop the whole project, we were surprised because the, the, the piece itself is quite interesting. It talks about the censorship in the Cuban regime. And talking to them, we, uh, it was funny that we ended up talking about the, the red line between censorship uh, uh, critique or reviews and the problems they have when they want to develop projects with the Cuban government. Now, all our actions uh, at Teatres de Proximidad or local uh, theatres network uh, also talk about this, this difference between blurry line between uh, censorship and uh, criticism, but here we also have the element of Cuban government. The piece is called um, Offside or Fuera del Juego, same thing in Spanish. It, it talks about uh, the role played by the Cuban government since 1975 because of Roberto Padilla, who had uh, the uh, Cuban uh, Poetry Award in 68. And after the award, he was uh, titled or labeled as counter-revolutionary. And uh, when he was released, to everybody's surprise, he publicly blamed himself for being a counter-revolutionary. And that's when the Cuban government started uh, actively attacking uh, the arts. So we talk about the story of Roberto Padilla and the person in the government who acted as censor and uh, crafted the plan to channel or limit everything that uh, was to do with the Cuban arts or cultures or intellect. Now, what's interesting about this show, this piece, is that we link Abel González from Melo which, who is the playwright, and Dagoberto Rodríguez. Dagoberto Rodríguez is one of the artists, uh, multimedia artists, who's most present in Latin America, and they've worked together through the Maidin Company, who, which is uh, Dagoberto's, and they do a half documentary, sort of uh, fictionalized documentary on Roberto Padilla's case. So. We have two different actions based on this. One on the 14th Tuesday with the whole company, giving more the floor to Dagoberto and Abel, and they'll talk to us about the Cuban artist, the role of the Cuban artist when faced with the fear of the power of the regime. The other day, talking to them, it was interesting because the word dictator was never pronounced by them when they're here. 
And when they are in Cuba, they talk about El Comandante. It's funny how they speak to avoid censorship or political repression for state performing arts. So on the 14th, we'll have part of the company. And on the 21st, we wanted to delve a little bit deeper into how they, the company works and how they do, I don't know, production and uh, management in Cuba. Abel Gonzalez has a degree on the theater arts uh, by, from the Cuban Institute. So he's going to talk to us about that. Politics, society and theater in Cuba on the 21st. Obviously, this show was, or the piece was prepared for July this year, but in the end, they'll come in May 2021. I mean, it was a matter of dates. They are going to go on tour. So they'll come to us for three days at the end of May. And that's it. If anybody has a question, yes, yes, we are being asked. Could you tell us the, the name of the Cuban members of the project? Oh, the cast. The o actor is Yadier Fernandez, who plays Roberto Padilla. Then we have uh, his wife, who's Jeanette Gala. And the, the comrade who helps them, who doesn't really help him, he's the representative of the, gov of the government, is Rey Montesinos. So there are three actors, and then we have the creative team, Dagoberto, who does multimedia, and Abel Gonzalez, who's written the script and does the mise-en-scene. Okay, we have another question for Felipe. Felipe, could you tell us how we can listen to the radio play on the 13th? And I invite you all to go to our network, teatredeproximitat.cat, because that's where you'll have access to all these actions. Most of them are online. And you can register uh, in advance. There are links to register. And you have all the information about dates, times, how to register, and uh, you can do it all on our platform Zoom, or you will be given the link. Felipe, do you want to answer? Do you want to say anything? Well, basically, you've said that, Marina, on the website teatresdeproximitat.cat and also on salafenix.com. Look forward to seeing you there. Great. Thank you all. There are no more questions, and I'm being told we have a three-minute break, and we'll be back with the second session. So thank you all. Hello, my name is Albert Vila. I'm the artistic director of La Patita Malumaluga. And I would like to present you today uh, Bob Marley for Babies. Uh, this will be our new production that will be premiered at Greg uh, 2021. This is the second part of a trilogy uh, that we started uh, six years ago with Beatles for Babies. Uh, we've been able to tour 14 countries uh, over 600 performances and almost 100,000 spectators in these uh, six years. Music is obviously very important in this production. There will be around 20 songs that will be performed by five singers. We will use a lot of different voice techniques. Some of them like uh, jazz improvisation, all the a cappella techniques, uh, live loops. Beatbox. <laughs> Techniques that we can play and we can offer something a bit different than a pure concert. We wanted to research in 
Jamaican and other kind of Afro-Caribbean dances mixed together with contemporary dance. And this way we can find uh, very effective, colorful movements that can be performed by the musicians. Our audience always go up on stage. It will be six per six square meters where audience will be all around us, 360 degrees around us. And then behind the audience, just slightly behind, there will be a cube, a big cube, where we will have projections all around in the four uh, sides of the cube and obviously at the ceiling and on the floor. We would like to uh, interact with the audience through the voice. But we would like to play with them, to invite them to sing, not in a kar karaoke way. We would like to use several uh, games techniques with the voice. Uh, hola. Uh, Hello. Let's continue now with the second session for today. If you allow me, concerning the previous session, since uh, the different projects have been have been discussed already and they've been improved, what's really important to me is the fact that this project has uh, united uh, all the venues. You've seen the website, so it's very interesting and this is going to give rise to many more different uh, projects. So very interesting for this network of venues in the in, in Barcelona. So a bridge with uh, Latin America, this is going to yield fruit, no doubt. And there is another added value, if you allow me to say so. All the projects uh, were physical and now they've been translated online. So uh, radio theater, streaming, online theater, we're testing, we're testing in, against this new backdrop, what we can do and, and what uh, other solutions we can find in order to, well, to continue working. Let's uh, move on now and discuss a project that I feel very close to me because they're my friends, I think I can call them friends of mine. And we've collaborated with them. It's a project that we felt was very much uh, necessary because when we say Latin America, the continent is so huge, so many different countries, so many differences. And sometimes uh, for us uh, from Europe, it's, it's difficult to work with Latin American countries because, we, because you, you don't know exactly with whom. So we needed a tool. We needed a tool like the one we're going to hear about now, a mapping tool. And hopefully this is going to be uh, useful for future collaborations. Let's now hand over to the team uh, that uh, conducted the mapping. I was involved. I was involved in the beginning, but the festival actually, well, stole some time uh, from me. I apologize because I had to step aside for a while, but uh, Fernando, Natasha, I don't know exactly who's going to take the floor now, but uh, I'm sure you'll see that, uh, yes, dear Eduardo, you'll see that the project is in, in good hands. Eduardo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Cesc. I am very grateful to the Greg Festival and uh, Cesc himself because, well, you gave us the opportunity to start with this project. Uh, I would like to thank all the team in Greg Pro because, well, we have the chance now to present our project. And I wanted to say as well that uh, this uh, uh, movement uh, of small venues uh, getting together that uh, has really thrilled me. So maybe this should be included in our mapping. We'll see about that. Well, it's so hot in here. You see the thermometer, that's my home, and that's the temperature in the room. I mean, 29, 30 degrees Celsius uh, without air conditioning. So I think I'm about to uh, die or something. Anyway. 
sometimes quite often we listen to inspirational talks and other creators and different uh, people from different corners and ibero america and i say ibero america on purpose because we have this disconnection some people uh, maybe don't speak uh, spanish or or portuguese so maybe this term ibero america is not familiar to you but uh, uh, well, Latin America, Central America, South America, and then we have the Iberian Peninsula, of course, Spain and Portugal. So that's the idea, uh, the underlying idea behind the term Ibero America. That's, that's our backdrop. Again, I was uh, referring to inspiration, inspirational practices. They're very original. They're great opportunities for us. So sometimes we just wonder how to get to them because uh, there's a lot of knowledge there, a lot of practice, a lot of experience. So how to get in touch with those teams, the networks that uh, maintain those projects. It's necessary to, to know those projects and uh, articulation and co collaboration. That's something that goes together with uh, with the arts, uh, artistic projects, artistic processes. Uh, they all require collaboration. So in, as curators of living arts, uh, we have uh, worked on this strategically, initial strategic uh, mapping project of this uh, innovative uh, structures and, and project. So thanks to Greg, we have conducted a, a study and uh, you, you can see that we are sharing the screen now. So you can take a look at some of those practices that, that we call inspirational practices and hopefully you can get inspiration from, from them as well. The idea with this presentation is to well, show the uniqueness uh, behind our piece of research. Uh, there is a link you can access and you can actually download a PDF file. Uh, from there, I don't know if the information is uh, in the chat. Let me just check it out quickly. Let's see. Let me just um, type it in so that you can go straight to downloading the mapping project. It's already in the chat box for you to access. And now I would like, if, if Katarina can maybe stop sharing the screen thank you thank you katarina so let's introduce the group of managers that are behind this project they're all here katarina saraiba uh, from coimbra is joining us hello kata are you there katarina sí. Hola. yes here i am hello okay. can you hear me yes perfectly great so from portugal we have katarina then we have fernando garcia from cochamamba is he there so, yes, good morning and, and good evening. Hello, Natasha Mello. She's uh, in Montevideo right now, joining us then from Uruguay. Oh, not as uh, warm as you are. Mm, damn, she says. It's uh, good to see you. Good to see you all. Let's see, are we all here? Oh, Natasha coordinated the, the, the work carried out by several collaborators, Ricardo Klein, for instance, and he's uh, joining us from Barcelona. He prepared the methodology behind the project. Are you there, Ricardo? Can you just say hello? Yes, hello from Barcelona. Good evening, good morning. Good to see you, Ricardo. And there's another team coordinated by Natasha uh, in uh, Uruguay, the designer, for instance, Federico Calasa, the proofreaders, Lucia, Alessandre, and the team. They did the Portuguese version, for instance, from Coimbra. So we are very, very grateful. Some of the members of the team are not here in the Zoom session, but we just wanted to uh, just mention them. So let's present the project project beyond the PDF file because of course you can check it out later let's um, let's just explain let's uh, uh, let's explain how this first phase 
developed. And uh, well, we have here six people that have had something to do with the project as consultants, as, as managers of projects that have already been mapped. So firsthand experience. And we will end by explaining what the, well, what the future holds for us and what the next steps will be. Let's uh, now invite Ricardo to maybe start with a brief introduction, the methodology that uh, was used. Uh, Ricardo, if you are so kind as to explain the methodology that we decided to use. Great, thank you. Ricardo is now sharing his screen. Unfortunately, we cannot hear Ricardo. His microphone is muted. Ah, now it's working. Great, we can hear you now, Ricardo. Great. As uh, Eduardo was saying, this is the first stage, so it's the first uh, attempt, the first approach. We wanted to highlight uh, diverse Ibero-American experiences in the field of living arts and uh, activities or experiences that we consider to be best practice. Uh, the initiatives that somehow translate processes and, and experiences that are positive in relation to the development of the cultural industry uh, on the territory and in what has to do with all the stakeholders. Now. That was the starting idea. We divided the whole process into two parts. Of course, this is just a, a glimpse about the methodology. That's why we would like to invite you to get a closer look at the file and read the whole mapping, because as I say, we split the methodology into two. The first part of the methodology has to do with the initial phase, and we invited a series of managers and collaborators from all of Latin America. So we decided the criteria, a set of criteria that would enable us to work with them and interact with them. Here are some of the characteristics. For instance, we wanted them to um, have a broad uh, vision about the, well, the, the backdrop, the scene in terms of living arts in uh, Ibero America. So they need to know well what this means and what this means in terms of innovation in, ter in terms of sustainability, etc. So two phases, as I said before, the well, we send a, a form a survey to 209 uh, experts in different countries in Ibero America, and they had to name at least five best practices to them in their in their country. We got a lot of. Uh, replies, we actually had 131 uh, answers and uh, 575 proposals were considered to be best practice, and that was acknowledged, and 512 uh, were not repeated. So they're, they were all original, so imagine the uniqueness and the traits of living art in the cultural scene in, in Latin America. That's how and that's when we move on to the second stage, the, the mapping development in itself. The promoter team actually picked 55 out of those experiences and we also devised a series of criteria with uh, which we wanted to, to work and base uh, ourselves on. We wanted to uh, have representation coming from all of Latin America, so projects from all the Ibero-American countries. Uh, the repetition of experience by the experts, that was more a quantitative criterion, if you, if you wish, and some were qualitative, some were quantitative, uh, as you see, and we wanted these uh, activities, these experiences to be as representative as, uh, as possible, so we didn't want to focus exclusively on one single city in one country, for instance. This is then going to be visualized, of course, uh, uh, on the map. So we, we split uh, the project into the visual 
part of the project. So uh, the communication, part of the story, etc. This is all again uh, broken down if you read the the whole file about methodology. So I strongly recommend you read it. Then we gathered information that's more general, more descriptive about this uh, project, of course, in relation to what best practice means and why those practices were considered to be a best practice. It's just just very brief introduction that I that I did just for you to well to be eager to to learn more and to know more if you have the time to read the documents. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Let's now uh, share our first impressions, uh, the, the feedback, let's say, from the colleagues. But there's, there's one thing I would like to uh, focus on from the beginning. All the professionals that will address us now have uh, talked to me in other venues and uh, we've discussed the results of this mapping and how this has improved or helped in their practices in their real experience so there's something that most of us know well which is the fact that most of the managers uh, behind these uh, mappings they combine public uh, management private company production academia mediation, artistic creation. So the, the, the turnover is, is important. And we're, we're going to be show you, showing you a video from, it's video 01, David, if you want, if you want to play it. Okay, I consider myself to be an etc. artist. I develop my, well, capabilities. Uh, uh, wearing different hats, of course, I use uh, dance. Uh, that is the language that I that I use mostly, and the different transformation spaces that dance allows uh, me to to use. I think that uh, well, being a curator is also an important part of my story and uh, well this uh, uh, curatorial and generation of uh, frameworks uh, that has to do with management and it all boils down again to being a curator so there are no it's like there are no boundaries and of course i work with people teams of people that can work on the different parts um, of the project uh, the sensitiveness uh, the volume of the project and that is very it's very important of course i i, I couldn't do this by myself i never uh, work alone never so some it's difficult to to define and what I do, uh, is, is it something that I really do or that we do, or that some people get together and do? Because this is a, an addition, you know, many people add up here and, uh, and join the project because it resonates uh, with them. And it's um, doing activism like, you know, resistance and the political side of the story and being part of a of a political project political idea that's that's uh, that's also very important uh, to to fight uh, for better conditions uh, in the cultural industry scene in latin america so i really like that this this political fight um, and being uh, a leading character in the creation of new things that's something that uh, well, makes me feel enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic. So I want to do things. Great. There are some people who say that the sound was less than ideal, but I mean, I could hear it wonderfully. I hope the rest of you could. 
Okay, let's hope you all got that. Okay, now I'm going to ask Katarina. She's one of the first people who got <laughs> to <laughs> get information about all of this. This all got at the very last minute. And she's one of those people, Katarina, who could have a first analysis, which has also helped us prepare this session. So, Katarina, Hola. could you please? Bueno, yo desde Coimbra, no, no está en 30 en grados, pero, Hi, I'm in um, pero Coimbra, también como Jimena, no, entre varios degrees, proyectos uh, y esto, uh, well. este also, me agradó like Jimena, muchísimo de hacer uh, porque ha sido una colaboración totalmente iberoamericana entre distintos usos horarios y with different muy divertido en ese sentido. Involved. ¿no? So much fun um, in that bueno, respect. En, and, en um, lo que son las primeras impresiones generales de so los proyectos, some que initial impressions han sido apuntados por los expertos que, que han colaborado y ese es muy interesante, ¿no? porque como dijo um, Ricardo, es, ha sido una, esta Ricardo compilación said, que, que viene en la publicación es una, el resultado de colaboraciones dentro del espacio iberoamericano. Lo que han dicho eh, es que así como punto y curiosidades a, Just to give you a few a different points mismo, and, and I don't know, interesting facts. Han apuntado muchas now. estructuras y proyectos que uh, se basan en procesos colaborativos, como si fuera como una buena práctica. Projects, as if y como también kind of Jimena menciona en la conversación. ¿no? Um, la visibilización de proyectos uh, comunitarios también es importante y ha sido mucho mencionado. Of community y uh, mucho de Muchos de los proyectos que están and en esta publicación uh, están directamente relacionados con prácticas artísticas experimentales, que es curioso. Uh, pero, uh, pero no solo, por ejemplo, en países más uh, pequeños, um, las disciplinas artísticas más tradicionales, yo te voy a decir cuándo poner el video, que es más well, fácil, I'll let you know David, when perdón, to go on to the video, David, guión. that um, might be easier. Sorry, los, I'm, I'm changing um, my plan here. Las estructuras, hay David. estructuras tradicionales que siguen siendo apuntadas como buenas prácticas, which are still, uh, pero todas uh, tienen un, used as un best acercamiento al territorio But, muy profundo, uh, en el sentido de que um, to the territory. Todo, van más allá de, los, I mean de lo artístico, It goes y invierten en el desarrollo de relaciones más profundas, no solo con los artistas, pero con el territorio y sus especificidades. Y una de las cosas interesantes que ha sido mencionada por, por muchos de los proyectos que están en, en la publicación como una buena práctica es el afecto y el cuidado como... como bueno, no sé, quizás por una cuestión de precariedad, Perhaps because de of lo que vivimos, the uh, quizás para escapar a las lógicas capitalistas, living, donde cada vez más estamos sometidos. Pero para ilustrar esto, yo así, ahora sí, David, let me pedía para poner el show you what video I mean. dos, David, donde we have video Eva number García. Two with Eva García. I think there is lack of recognition about what this kind of collaborative proposals contribute. No, they work with sort of uh, not the usual suspects, or they use different ways of working, perhaps closer to contemporary art, but perhaps for the audience at large, they're quite innovative. So they're surprising in that respect at least for me, and, and I rejoice in that, because I see that there is something changing. There is an adaptation between the situation we're living in and what these projects bring to the scene, this proximity, this closeness, this open, uh, active listening, cooperation being not just unidirectionally, but uh, It goes in multi directions with everybody winning. And there is the whole idea of the collectivization of uh, intelligence and knowledge. So there has been a kind of adaptation. And this makes me think that at the beginning of the pandemic, 
I have a little group, a little community where we work on, on culture. I was saying, hey, oh, woof, these projects are going to disappear. And they were telling me, the community was telling me, no way, these projects are finally going to appear. They're going to come up because we're all becoming more aware of how important it is to look after each other. And these projects aim to find well-being. There is a certain sector of the population who, perhaps because they don't know how to interrelate or interact or I don't know what part is understanding, what part is just feeling in this kind of experiences and they feel kind of awkward in these shows or in these experiences. So there's a lot of work to do to see what they contribute to these projects because they're obviously contributing and it's not just an artistic contribution. I mean, we're talking about building more active, engaged citizens. We're offering channels to citizens to be more engaged and more active in decision-making processes. Wow, it's amazing how there's a huge population, how they don't even think that those spaces are theirs. And it's not just that they don't feel capable, but they don't feel, they, they don't project there. The individual imaginary is, shif is shifted because you rehearse in a kind of oasis. It is like a, a, a protected space, a, a, you know, a rehearsal space which is protective. It's helpful. It's yours. It's home. And, and there you can, all of a sudden, you can project somewhere that you had never imagined. So we are fostering the idea of people imagining themselves uh, um, accessing different areas, different stages, different projects. Hola. Hello. Bueno, uh, como han visto, right. no estoy inventando. ¿eh? So, y, I'm not making it up. Y otra cosa okay. que, que me parece también interesante uh, something um, else that I think es que muchas de las prácticas apuntadas como buenas por estos expertos uh, so mencionan el carácter político de esas buenas prácticas. Que, talk about the political bueno, nature lo que decía Jimena, ¿no? Que de integrar la, 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 la o activar la ciudadanía, or, pero hay uh, muchos uh, en, de, en esta publicación que um, su foco uh, son cuestiones de género, um, uh, cuestiones in, in en América cases, Latina sobre uh, cultura uh, gender issues um, or sobre uh, Amerindia, racismo, indigenous peoples, uh, y, races, y por eso paso ahora uh, a, pido a David uh, para poner el video I'm going to ask David to show Mariana Suárez. Video 3 with Mariana Suárez. Es el 3. We talking about video 3. Yo creo que lo que salió en el mapeo en ese sentido refleja bien. I think that what we're seeing in this mapping is a good reflection of what we're living at least in Brazil today. I think that at some particular moment in time for us, politically, ideologically, we believed that all inequalities and all structural racism that we've always lived, it's always been there, we were beginning to face up to it. We, we felt that, uh, yeah, okay, this, this is there and it hurts, but there is a political front that's trying to face up to it. And all of a sudden, whoop, no. I mean, we're seeing that now, but over the last few years, um, in a way, all that basis that we thought was consolidated, a basis of anti-racist uh, thought, anti-inequalities, all of that, all of a sudden, is being questioned, particularly in political spheres. I mean, they're saying, racism, oh no, come on, but racism, there's no racism here. Or no, meritocracy is for everybody. I mean, inequalities, that's almost your choice. 
So there were this kind of uh, narrative political discourse that appeared in different uh, spheres in Brazil, which led people to believe, led us to believe that we needed to present a stronger counter reaction to this, not just as a global decision, but as a feeling. And I think that what we're seeing now is a series of organizations, of projects by artists who are increasingly trying to create some kind of mixture between the aesthetics of their productions and these issues, anti-racism in Brazil, which is really huge. The issue of inequality is appalling. And the issue also of this neo-racist discourse that we are witnessing. I mean, there is this public and private discourse, I mean, at home with families. There is this highly institutionalized racist narrative. And you can feel it. You can smell it. And I think it is almost natural for a production, culture, organization, management, everything to do with culture, to focus on that right now. The issue of inclusion as something which is strong. Bueno, y estas algunas Great. de las particularidades y And ahora those paso la are Fernando, some Garcia, of the traits that I wanted to, to share with you. Now Fernando is going to continue and is going to go Fernando, on about those traits uh, that for sure you can also años. check in the document. Thank you, Kata. It's been a real pleasure for me to be part of this team and uh, um, help somehow to to show what's going on in the scene of the living art. Uh, and of course, this is just a little seed and it'll grow, hopefully, but it st still helps us understand many of the ongoing processes, as some of you mentioned already, about the context, the practice, what we've done, what I've done. I would like to say that uh, empowerment is a concern and also the development of uh, capacities for the different artists, because there's, there's not that much um, formal official training here. Also, um, accompaniment for the artists and to help them train uh, in terms of uh, venues and networks and centers. We, we are constantly seeking out, uh, trying to reach out uh, and uh, trying to get help from the government so that they uh, will uh, provide uh, the right to a cultural industry and to a cultural Cultural scene here as well, and uh, well, we'll see. We'll see video number five now with Maria Jose Cifuentes. What the what the reality here is like? And Maria Jose is, by the way, joining us now here. We are working. We are working in networks. Uh, Unfortunately, Fernando is muted. Anyway, he was asking again for the video number five. An interpreter presumes. Hear this. I think that most of the venues, also in terms of best practice, this has to do with the fact that uh, um, from the point of view of cultural institutions as the cultural center in the city, you know, governmental institutions most of the time, they, they lack a best practice themselves. So we need to generate spaces and provide the, the venues and the place uh, that can provide training and then can help artists. These are actions that right now are not part of the cultural policies in Latin America, because Latin America, when it comes to cultural industries, cultural policies, uh, well, the countries here have tried to integrate as well capitalist uh, practices. So the focus, uh, the focus here in Latin America is on the dissemination and the production and the, the, the marketing of the play or the piece 
so many countries that might be very interesting in terms of management, for instance, or production and on other rationales that might be might be very interesting for our study. Well, are out of the of the rationale of cultural policy as understood here in in Latin America. Many of those spaces, many of those venues or projects, we are not government based. We're not funded by the government. We need to uh, well take part in public bids or tenders. We need to ask for grants. So in the long run, we are doing public uh, public policy, even if we are a private space, and we do a lot in time in terms of uh, supporting creation and safeguarding the artists and these actions should be a well part of the public policy and this should come from the ministry of culture but it's not the it's not the case so uh, dialogue with the government is key we independent uh, venues are rowing against the current, trying to be constructive, trying to build uh, supports and and create networks and you know protect ourselves. Of course, we can do uh, what we can do, but uh, we're we're fragile. If the, if an economic crisis hits the country, we're we're done. So we need to reinvent ourselves, and that's the way to sustain ourselves. And we need to juggle all the time, like these guys are pro so that they are well candidate for certain certain grants otherwise otherwise uh, it's very tough and if the government is not aligned with the uh, culture it's difficult and many governments in power right now are just not interested at all uh, in those as aspects just maybe dissemination so the public policy is only focused on the recipient so they don't support the artist they think only about the, the recipient, the, the citizen, and, and okay, yeah, we need the citizens to receive something, but we need to focus also on the artist. We need to support the artist so that the play is a quality piece, and then the citizenship may benefit from from that. So uh, independent projects like ours uh, are struggling to survive all the time. End of the video. Yes, well, as a matter of fact, that's the context that we that we have to work with. It's just a live example of the of the situation. The government is just invisible, not acting at all. You know, many festivals have to start from scratch, year after year, season after season, and we're uh, vulnerable. So we are struggling to to be sustainable. We want sustainability because that's the only way we will survive. The cultural and linguistic context in our case is the same, Spain and Latin America, and that is a huge uh, potential. Complicity is key. Uh, we have bi-national institutes, international centers that support artistic projects, and so they become a very, very important uh, allies. Let's watch another video, video number four in this case with Sergio Yusera. We're working in networks now more than ever. We are a cultural center and we collaborate with six others, and that was impossible in the past. So uh, cultural centers that are official, I'm, I'm referring to organize a festival that's called FAE for the city in Lima. The city is not doing this, so we ourselves decided to, to organize such festival. But of course, we cannot do this alone. So that's why we need the collaboration uh, from other uh, centers and the independent uh, companies as well. They, they're there to, to show and exhibit their, their work. So we want to be a platform uh, to provide them with, with visibility so that their discourse can go international so that they find a way also to fund what they do because the internal market wouldn't allow for this there's no governmental uh, funding so the only way for an independent group to survive well uh, resorts to the support coming from a binational institution or they self uh, support or they can try to go international and then you know, gain uh, earnings there and then continue with their with their job 
with their task. So that's the role that we've started to play and uh, the old managers, the cultural directors and different uh, official cultural centers, they were more selfish, let's say, in terms of uh, building their own spaces. They just wanted to stand out. Uh, I'm exaggerating, you know, you know what, what I mean. Uh, this idea of the artist, uh, the director, with huge inspiration that's the romantic idea and uh, the uh, the fact that they don't need anybody else that's the that was the idea in the past and that's been overcome in peru or it's being overcome because uh, well we need to work together because uh, we have our weaknesses as well and in terms of uh, at the micro level i think this is also happening i'm not that acquainted with that reality but there's more opening as far as i know in the center in the cultural center that i run we are in contact with the Siemens uh, Foundation, it's called Re, uh, it's called uh, Ciudades Reveladas. And that's the name of the project, Rebel Cities, and we are going to uh, show the reality in different districts in the city. We had a first virtual uh, conversation, a webinar, and it's been uh, visited by over twenty thousand people. You know, five, ten years ago, this wouldn't have had the repercussion that it's having today. People coming from traditional theater, traditional dance, they're super interested in the project and they and they want to be a part of this change. I don't know if it's because it's uh, fashionable or, or it's a genuine interest or, or both, probably. It doesn't matter. It's like opening the doors to really working in networks. And that's what the reality is demanding because we simply just can not work otherwise. Yes, indeed, a new reality, new needs, new ways of collaborating and just being aware of the fact that the, well, it's a new reality. Let's uh, highlight uh, about the mapping again, and of course taking, taking into account that the, the vast territories here in Latin America and the fact that the capital cities sometimes tend to centralize too much. The experts, collaborators wanted to pick uh, uh, best practices and projects that uh, would not focus exclusively on on large uh, cities and uh, there was a key there was a key question which was uh, how to make those practices visible beyond large cities is this to do with uh, politics or is this a reality that we need to uh, fight and we need to transform things uh, and last but not least about uh, practice in general we emphasize the work with the community in networks generating spaces uh, uh, generating interrelational spaces with diverse uh, realities in the different territories with their characteristics with their uh, savoir faire with their know-how so uh, that's why we think this mapping project is a key tool uh, and it's uh, added value to this Ibero-American project to understand our different realities and the emerging traits. Let's uh, hand over now to Natasha. She has been coordinating us, coordinating our job, and she will continue discussing the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we we heard a siren, yes, wailing in the background. Uh, was that the police coming after us already? Anyway, uh, that was just a, a joke. Uh, again, about networking and articulating the mapping. As you just heard, this has been an attempt to identify, to be able to understand and analyze uh, uh, the, the context and to be able to articulate and continue articulating because we've been doing this for, for some time now. Let's uh, watch uh, the video, the video by Octavio. Yes. Don't worry. I'll just uh, I'll just show a brief uh, piece. Uh, how long do you want me to speak? Oh, two three minutes. Give me just uh, two three minutes, and then we can share with with the larger audience. If you agree. Okay. Okay. Just to be sure. Just wanted to know. Oh, let's go to. Uh, 
exactly 57 seconds in latin america maybe this uh, might be an interesting starting point okay in the latin american context the networks uh, were born at the end of last century and uh, against this uh, backdrop we started to see the dimension uh, the possibility of actually having latin american plays uh, tour around a common cultural space because in the past we had uh, relations with central uh, countries so cooperation bodies like uh, the british council the the french institute and uh, those uh, those kind of of institutions the get institute so they would uh, promote the distribution the, the touring of uh, of foreign shows and pieces but there was no link between the managers the producers uh, uh, in connection with latin america so there was no knowledge about the the reality of latin american uh, peace the buenos aires uh, festival for instance has been alive for 52 years and they uh, they were doing so uh, in comparison to other countries. So uh, that was a pioneering network that was born in Brazil, uh, other Latin American uh, plays stored around Latin America. And that's, uh, that's how today we have a network of festivals. And interestingly enough, the fabric was born, not just uh, based on exchange, but also based on a network of, of love, I would say and, and uh, solidarity and that is a very very important dimension care and trust because that was trust based uh, trust strategies were created and just to summarize on the part of 57 festivals in 12 different countries they got together and they did co-productions and they toured together and they did their recommendations and that's why we have our network that uh, is uh, is sound and it's stable and it's based on solidarity and trust and it's uh, cooperative cooperative work that we do very important now more than ever maybe because uh, you know with the pandemic in the current context either we all save all together and help each other be saved or we will just think and uh, we will we will drown all together so it's either we all survive together or we all disappear together so we try to collaborate we try to collaborate in latin america we try to help ourselves and we try to um, maintain those bridges thinking about uh, cultural uh, common space language, ways of understanding those relationships and the fact that we have similar ways of working. It's very important to also keep alive the relationship, the link with international organizations because they are, they are um, sometimes too vertical and so we need to establish a, a dialogue uh, I'm, I'm speaking now i'm thinking of european institutions mostly when i say that they have this this vertical way of working and the dynamics and the line their festivals are maybe too vertical so if they if, if they don't dialogue we're not interesting okay we're not interested it's uh, either take it or leave it so then i leave it if that is the case right now what's clear for us is uh, the issue of uh, articulation, coordination, and the territory. Based on that, we see some repeated elements, constant elements, like the element of uh, 
the precarious situation. We see some challenges that we want to face up to and that we want to share with you as uh, cultural agents and whom we want to stand by because if this moves forward is thanks to cooperation. Now, we want to analyze uh, some of the experiences that have reached us because up until now we've uh, had uh, 55, and there are many, many more. And we also want to generate a more value, deeper analysis of all these issues that we've heard from all these videos. We want to uh, systematize, analyze, uh, study those subjects at depth. And we want to then spread the results and generate analysis and discussion fori at uh, other scales and exponentially in this wonderful network of coordinators that we can see we have and which, as Octavio said, we have built for many, many years in many different networks. So I don't want to focus now on what we know how to do because that is, I don't know, how we can face up to precarious situations because that's a constant for us. I mean, we're used to that. But we, we want to see what the real challenges are, those spaces where we haven't yet left our imprint, the questions we haven't asked ourselves, the alliances we haven't struck yet, or the values that uh, culture has and we haven't focused on yet. For us, our intention behind this study, this mapping, is to articulate, to coordinate different spaces for analysis, for reflection, to bring together theory and action in a joint manner and generating alliances with universities, with academic bodies, because we feel that we need to strengthen some spheres to make sure that rights become facts. I mean, culture as a right should be exercised. Culture as the fourth pillar of development should be supported politically. And we believe that alliances with other fields of knowledge that we have been talking about for so long, they should become a reality. We go on talking about culture in cultural circles, and we feel that the time has come to have other logics at play, other visions that will take us to new paths where our value will meet our intention. It is clear that we're working in precarious situations because we are cultural workers and that should disappear, really. And we need to focus on the continuity of our projects. We are not finding enough sustainability in time. It's exhausting. I mean, we could take it as good practice, but you know, we dancers know about that. Uh, when training is just always the same thing, that's not efficient training, it's efficient rehearsal. You need new values, you need a new perspective to, to take you a step, a qualitative step forwards in, in our project management in this case. So let me try and summarize these three points, the issue of new alliances, uh, capacity development spaces, and the new challenges of transforming rights into facts and uh, destroying precarious situations. Those are the three points I want to leave you with. I'll close with that. Excellent. Thank you, and apologies for the video issues. Now, what was I going to say? I think we have some questions 
Um, I think everybody knows that you can write your questions on the chat, right? Um, while we're waiting for questions, we can go on having a chat. We still have 15 minutes. Uh, I mean, while we're waiting for questions, let me say something. And it might be a, a mere anecdote, but it might also be important. We've started with uh, this idea of the map because of different conversations we had some time ago. We, we were talking about what we could do to work on the training of cultural managers in Latin America, in Iber America. We talked about the possibility of creating a master course on performing arts in Latin America. And as part of those discussions or, or that talking about that master's course, we started, sorry, Eduardo, could you stop fanning yourself? Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's driving us crazy. I'm sorry that you're going to be hot, but you're, you're fanning the microphone at the same time. Apologies, says Eduardo. I didn't realize. Apologies, I've lost my thread now, naturally. We want to see what is the role of uh, performing arts managers in Latin America for the next decade. What are those people doing? What are their best practices? What do we need to adapt to as managers? And that's how this idea came about. And um, it was very interesting how we got in touch with all these managers or consultants who in turn referred us to other projects with interesting innovative management. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, something else that we could discuss what we are managing, how we are managing it, and why. Is this a question? Oh no, somebody is just sending fresh air <laughs> from a cooler place. That's great. Well, sí, well if there are yo, no questions, we can all just go and have a beer. No, no, let me please add something. De lo que son las expresiones yeah, something del about uh, ¿no? expressions in Latin America. Como una We've cosa talked común, about claro languages Brasil uh, share the language. Obviously, Brazil and Portugal share a language which is not shared by the rest uh, una de las of Latin America. Now, something we said precisely was how interesting the word was, manager, gestor in Spanish. What does manager mean nowadays in this world which is where culture is becoming increasingly um, Nos parecía interesante Corporate. proponer también it's, culture otros, is becoming bueno, a commodity, a gestor, a market. Porque, sí, al so final, we wanted to keep the term manager, because yes, we manage our context, we manage our projects, but we wanted gestor, to go beyond that. Tal cual, esto es. We wanted to go beyond the idea of manager as such. Now, when we talk about a manager here, we are talking about somebody who has full awareness of contents, mediation, um, que, claro, relations. En, en algunos so, in in some for example, in Portugal, in Portuguese, the word mm, cultural manager no is like, cultural, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think cosas. I am a cultural um, manager, even y, though I do manage y, lots y of también, things. Uh, eso para and, decir um, que, claro, I'm esa, just saying all of this de to come to the point that this concept muy, of muy manager is, is a very wide pensar en todas esas, concept. Esas and it, we think it's important to bear in mind all those uh, um, sites, all those different the possibilities covered by, by the term manager de, and by the context and the field we work visto, in. Because our field, as we've seen de, and you will see, uh, is de uh, a field which de proposes, suggests de changes and de la social attitudes and empowerment of the population de, and de empowerment even of performing uh, artists um, 
and this is something which I, I think is important. Because I wanted to have said that before in my presentation and I forgot. Okay. Okay, I'll find you. I cannot find myself. So with this, we're going to leave unless somebody has something urgent to say. If that is not the case, I just want to thank you all. It's amazing. I'm delighted. There are 122 people putting up with us all this time. And I just send you a big, huge kiss. Hugs to all of you. Bueno, y solo para terminar es que and todo yes, eso ha sido posible por toda la colaboración y a mí me ha encantado la, el nivel de respuesta de parte del sector como esa necesidad de visibilizar lo que son buenas prácticas que me parece súper importante, um, como decía Ricardo, de todos That's los cuestionarios que hemos saying. enviado, La from all the, uh, in all the surveys we've sent out, we've had a huge percentage of responses. So it, it's, I think we need to talk about best practices because unfortunately there are also bad practices. Oh, Kata, I forgot to say something which is really important and I don't know whether Natasha said it, but um, we, we said that we want to continue with this work and we want to have a more analytical publication and uh, also we want to translate it into other languages, French, English, German, whatever, I don't know. And just we want to make sure that people from outside our Latin American space can link up and can share this best practices that we have found in our space. So if there's anybody listening who wants to support our project to give it continuity or want to support the translation, please get in touch with us through the festival or through ourselves. And yeah, with this, I think we can just express our thanks and say goodbye. No, 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 no way, no way. I want to thank everybody, hang on. I want to thank you for this report, this project. What with the first course of uh, local theaters, Teatres de Proximidad, and this amazing task that you've all done, I think that the menu today has been absolutely exquisite, delicious. And I want to encourage all the rest of you, I can see you on Zoom, to join us again for the third day of Zoom Pro. We'll go, we'll travel to Brasil Segrestado, kidnapped Brazil in Antique Teatra. And we'll talk about the projects for Greg 21 on our session called Coffee Together, where we'll present the co-productions for next year, because obviously this festival is not going to be stopped, not even by COVID. We will march on. So thank you all. Welcome and we'll meet again tomorrow. Please, big hugs.